Good morning. I've got a handful of announcements for you today. Uh, one is uh, something that uh, I had forgotten until, uh, until Diane reminded me this last week, and that is February, along with the month of September, is our Alabaster Month. And I had just let the month come and forgotten it. It's a month where we remember that uh, uh, we are engaged in numerous world areas around the world and, and like to give to help uh, build new churches and ministry facilities uh, in our various mission areas. And it just uh, comes from recognizing that uh, we can give and be a part. And usually uh, the strategy is throughout the year as you collect your loose change to give that every six months in February and September. And oftentimes we'll collect those in, uh, in little alabaster boxes and you'll see a blue box out there with uh, all, the, all the tools of handymen who, who, would, who would build a, a church uh, printed on the box and uh, it collects your loose change and then, then give that. I recognize as we are becoming more and more a cashless society, perhaps uh, giving to alabaster if you'd like to do that so it might come uh, by way of a check or, or something else. But um, if you want to give to Alabaster, feel free at any point in time over the next few weeks to leave your Alabaster offering in that church, that vis visual reminder that uh, we are helping our missionaries around the world who, who don't always have a place as they are sharing the good news, a place, a central place yet to worship and uh, to bring those who are being converted to the faith. And so if you would like to give to that, feel free to do so. Also, during the Lent season, as we um, I'll get ready for Easter and then also District Assembly. Uh, we are collecting crisis care kits, uh, which are ways in which we provide just a, a, a tangible way of saying we want to equip those who have, have entered into a crisis moment where perhaps they find themselves with nothing for a short period of time, saying, here, here's some basic needs to help you get through the next couple of days. And if you would like to help us with that, the list of what to get is, is placed in some two-gallon bags that are also on the table out there next to the uh, wonderful baked goods. And so uh, feel free to grab one of those and, um, and uh, share with that. And then we bring that to our district assembly, which is um, just a few weeks after Easter this year. And, uh, and that gets uh, included with a bunch of other churches who have done this as well to share with those in need. Next week is uh, we're going to have a guest speaker, Reverend Hazel Seavey. She is uh, a, a pastor here on the district who is engaged with uh, uh, Heart, Heart for Africa and is just absolutely uh, in love with the work that she does. And I thought it would be great to have a missionary come and share some of the work that they are doing. And um, so she's going to come and join us, and we're, that's going to be our Faith Promise Sunday, a way in which we remember that we are a sending out church, a church that cares about how the gospel is going forth in our world. And uh, every year we give to... Um, well, in the church we call funding the mission, which is uh, supporting the missionary activity of, share, of spreading the gospel throughout the world. It's a, it's a way of, of just um, uh, this, it, it, it's a way of making sure that our work and our commitment to share the gospel goes outside of just our immediate area, but to help those who otherwise do not yet have um, uh, a church and a foundation by, and a center by which to begin. And so we are engaged in missionary work throughout our world. And if, there, and if you would like to give towards that or give throughout the year towards that, uh, that Sunday is a way in which we start thinking, how, how can I make a promise and faith that I can give and support the work that the Lord is doing? Let's uh, move into worship, uh, hear the call to worship, and uh, celebrate our Lord this morning. Our call to worship is Psalm 41. Blessed are those who have regard for the weak. The Lord delivers them in times of trouble. The Lord protects and preserves them. They are counted among the blessed in the land. He does not give them over to desire of their foes. The Lord sustains them on their sickbed and restores them from their bed of illness. He said, have mercy on, I said, have mercy on me, Lord. Heal me, for I have sinned against you. My enemies say of me in malice, when will he die and his name perish? One, when one of them comes to see me, he speaks falsely while his heart gathers slander, and then he goes out and spreads it around. 
All my enemies whisper together against me. They imagine the worst for me, saying, A vile disease has afflicted him. He will never get up from the place where he lies. Even my close friend, someone I trusted, has turned against me. But may you have mercy on me, Lord. Raise me up that I may repay them. I know that you are pleased with me, for my enemy does not triumph over me. Because of my integrity, you uphold me and set me in your presence forever. Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen and amen. Why don't you stand with me and we'll worship together in song.
Let's pray together. Lord, we come to you thankful indeed that you have sought after us, that you have met us. And uh, Lord, you did that most clearly in Jesus Christ. And we thank you that you clothed yourself in flesh. You became one of us to show us, Lord, that you are always seeking to save us, drawing us into your family and into your love. And so, Heavenly Father, we've come into this place to give you praise and thanksgiving for that. And Lord, uh, we pray that uh, as we worship today, that we will feel indeed your presence. And that that presence would change and alter our trajectory. That we would find it giving us um, uh, energy and fuel and uh, motivation, Lord, to live out your love and your grace in all the areas of the world with which you uh, put us in. And Heavenly Father, that we would also learn to see with hope and Uh, and an eye for what you are doing, where, Lord, we are met with the trials of this life. Heavenly Father, we lift those up to you today in prayer. We lift up to you today those who are ill, those who uh, have procedures they are going through, those who have suffered injury. Lord, you know the concerns that are on the hearts of each one here. And, Lord, we are praying for uh, your deliverance, and we are praying for your steadfast comfort and peace in these moments. We trust in you and we turn to you today and uh, we are praying that uh, we would know uh, your will for our life, that we would be faithful to follow and uh, Lord, that we would see how you are still with us. Thank you again for uh, this time of worship. Receive our praise. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you would like to give to the Lord this morning, you're welcome to come forward and bring your offering to the offering plate. This one on today? Perfect. Good morning. First reading this morning from the book of Isaiah, chapter 43, starting at verse 18. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert, in the streams, in the wasteland. The wild animals honor me, and the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the desert and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. Yet you have not called upon me, O Jacob. You have not wearied yourselves from me, O Israel. You have not brought me sheep for burnt offerings, nor honored me with your sacrifices." 
I have not burdened you with grain offerings, nor wearied you with demands for incense. You have not bought any fragrant calamus for me, or lavished on me the fat of your sacrifices, but you have burdened me with your sins and wearied me with your offenses. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and remember your sins no more. The word of the Lord. Our second reading is from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verses 18 through 22. <clears throat> but surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me and Silas and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him it has always been yes. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Amen. Let's stand one more time if you can and we'll sing our
This is the first Sunday of Lent. It is a season in which we remember um, that uh, our God has loved us and is with us and has entered into the wilderness with us. And it is a time of fasting. It is a time of remembering that God is with us in the midst of our mortality. It is a time of denial. And this season, as we go through this week leading up to Easter, can, can be just focusing again and again, just its own kind of like, okay, here we go again. We're, we're focusing on this again. And, uh, and, it, and it creates its own kind of, kind of, kind of mood, if you will. Or, on the other hand, as, as we go into Lent, we can become hyper-focused on preparation for Easter. And we can find ourselves, like uh, our grocery stores, just focusing on the bright colors and the, and the anticipation of what happens when we get to Easter. Living into a future that we don't always get the opportunity to be in, because life indeed is hard, and there are, are struggles along the way. So this season, this year, we are going to rec- recognize that there are dust moments, there are mortal moments that the ashen moments of life are still leaving their mark on us just as they did last Wednesday. But yet, it is in those moments God is pleased to breathe life. And we believe that this is not just a one-and-done historical moment when He breathed life and created Adam and Eve, nor is it just a feel-good story, but it is the reality of who we are and where we are. God is still working in our lives and doing something with us, even in ashen seasons. And so this series is called Still Breathing Life into Dust, recognizing that God is at work and doing things in our life. And we're going to spend some time in Mark chapter 2 this season as we um, uh, reflect on this. So I'm going to start with uh, Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. When he returned, that's Jesus, when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many gathered around there, so many gathered around that there was no longer room for them, not even in front of the door. And he was speaking the word to them. Then some people came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. And when they could not bring to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And after And after having dug through it, they let down the mat on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts. Why does this fellow speak in this way? It's it's blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And at once Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were discussing these questions among themselves. And he said to them, Well, why do you raise such questions in your heart? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your your sins are forgiven, or to say, stand up and take your mat and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, stand up, take your mat, and go to your home. And he stood up and he immediately took the mat and went out before all of them so that they were all amazed and glorified God saying, we have never seen anything like this. This season, uh, this time, Mark uh, chapter 2, he goes back to Capernaum, says back to this home. Now earlier he was staying in the home of Simon and Andrew in their home in Capernaum. And so every reason to believe he's back in their home, that that is kind of the base of operations for them in Capernaum, that he's staying there. And he, he, he's at their home and, and it's going to be a small home. If you, if you were to look and study a little bit into what those homes were like, they would have just been one room, maybe two one major room where life took place, it would not have been very large. Our church certainly much larger. This sanctuary larger than their home would have been. And so they gather at home and the people hear, wait, Jesus is back. Jesus is back in town. He was healing before. Did you hear about the leper he heard just a moment ago, uh, just in the other town? And everyone's excited. So they start coming by and they start crowding. And you can imagine this small home gets filled up. And then there would be a line if 
anyone ever lined up for a celebrity. If you hear that somebody's famous is in town, you don't line up, you crowd around and you get as close as you can to. So I imagine that outside the crowds have grown large as well. And the people are trying to get as close as they possibly can to Jesus. Now when there's a crowd, there's a, there's a key to getting closer, I've learned. When you want to try to make your way through a crowd, you have to get as close as you can to the person in front of you, and then you have to dip your shoulder in. You dip your shoulder in, your hip can follow, and you just got in front of somebody. And then you can turn, and you get your shoulder in front of the next person. And you're just doing a little shoulder shuffle through the crowd, and it's kind of nice. And, you can, and that's how you kind of work your way through, and you can get through the crowd. But there's somebody who wants to see Jesus... And he can't do the shoulder shuffle. He can't move. His friends have carried him. They just take up way too much space. They can't find those little inches of space to kind of work their way through the crowd. They're stuck on the outskirts. How are they ever going to find and get to Jesus? And so they come with an, with an ingenious idea. They'll go to the back the home where, where the crowds aren't as thick and the crowd isn't there and they'll climb on top and they'll find a way through. They will just cut a hole through the roof. That's amazing to me as an idea. Like, uh, I can't imagine anyone thinking that this is going to be okay. <laughs> but yet, that's what they do. And, this, and the roof is going to be clay and mud and, and wood. It, this, is, this is not just like, hey, we're, we're peeling back, you know, like a tent layer or something. This is, uh, the actual uh, Greek word for, for Mark was they unroofed the roof, <laughs> which is like, uh, okay, that they are destroying a significant part. I would think, they didn't give names, I think if you would, would call the, the friends of this paralytic, I would call them like the tornado or something. They are unroofing the roof. And so, uh, the paral they, they uh, come, they are, uh, break a hole, that they cut or cut a hole, and they let him down, and Jesus is amazed. Not amazed at the fact that someone's coming in from above, but amazed at the faithfulness that they would go to such extremes to say, whatever happens, we need to get our friend to Jesus. If someone came through this roof right now, I would be absolutely amazed, but I would have said, why didn't you just use the front door? <laughs> like, but Jesus recognized the predicament, is amazed at their faith, and, goes, and, and says to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now that is an odd statement. Your sins are forgiven. I, I, I've read uh, multiple common, commentaries uh, in preparation for this, and all of them say, yeah, it's a little weird that he says your sins are forgiven when the issue is that he's paralyzed. Now there is some examples in Scripture where it seems like healing and it seems like forgiveness of sins, that they're kind of going hand in hand. There are some examples of that in Scripture that, that maybe there's a, there, there's a conflation of the two in this statement. But I think when he is clarifying to uh, uh, the scribes, which is easier to do, that there is already a distinction, that when he says your sins are forgiven, he's not thinking about healing. And so we're left wondering, well, what sins is he talking about? There's no indication of sin from the paralytic uh, in, this, in this chapter. I mean, unless you consider removing someone's roof from their home without permission a sin. Like, like what sin is, is he committing? Does Jesus know something we don't know? But this, I think... It comes down to trying to understand how sin can be understood and the Old Testament depiction of the forgiveness of sin. But before I get to that, let me say this. I've heard uh, throughout my life the, the, the major kind of articulation of what it means to have faith in God. At least in some that I've, in my understanding has been a popular articulation articulation of what it means to have faith in God over the last 50 years has been we need to have a relationship with God. You've probably heard this, and it's true. We need to have a relationship with God. That our faith is not just by works, as the Apostle Paul would say in Ephesians. Our faith is not just a laundry list of if I do the right things, I'm right with God. But it means having a relationship with God where we know He loves us and we love Him. It means that we can pray to God. That when we as Protestants say we believe in the, 
a priesthood of all believers. It's not just, oh good, we don't have to do confession anymore. But it's, we get to talk with God because God cares about each and every one of us. And you don't have to, and there is no privilege relationship between the priest or pastor and God, but that relationship is available for everybody. That a relationship with God is the most important thing in our faith. That what we do when we follow God, when we serve God, that it's done out of love and not merely duty. A belief that our our faith hinges on what we do would mean that sin is what we don't do or what we do wrongly. It's the wrongs we've committed. But if faith is relational, then sin... Sin's definition changes just a little bit. While it can incorporate certain wrongs, it's not just based on what's done wrong, but about being disoriented. It's about a broken relationship. Have you ever had a relationship where you've just realized that someone who was once a very close friend is no longer a close friend anymore? And you can't quite point to why that is. There's not, there's not something wrong that happened, not, 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 a, uh, not a wrong committed by you or by them, but just for whatever reason, the friendship has diminished. Like there's a barrier that's causing miscommunication or misunderstanding, and, and it just leaves you thinking, how do I get over this? Or, oh, well, wasn't it nice when we had a good relationship, and now I have to think, are we moving on, or how do I get over this? How do I fix this? Sometimes we, we wonder, how do I replenish that friendship? How do I renew that passion or just get to a point where we know that we can stand to be together the next time that we're together? Those are always kind of weird moments when you can't point to a situation, but you just recognize it seems like we've grown apart. How about a friendship or relationship where you know, you know, we haven't seen each other for years. Years. But I know the next time we do, the next time we see each other, no matter how long it's been, we're going to pick up right where we left off. Have you had one of those friendships before? Where you know that friendship is, is as good as it's ever been, even if you haven't had contact, even if you haven't seen each other, even that nothing has been done together in a long time. There's been no good interaction that you can point to, but the friendship is still solid. And you know even after all these years, if you were to see each other again for some reason, that you would just pick up right where it left off. And I can't help but think, when I think of faith, that it's more like that. It is a relationship that's always there. It's a relationship that has indeed impacted our life. It's affected us for the better. But that faith doesn't just hinge on expectations, but on the joy of living together. The joy of following and, and, and serving our God and knowing that He is with us. This is, this is how I think we, we come to understand our faith and what we mean when we say our faith is a relationship. And so I, I think we find this in the Old Testament as well. In, in, in the Mosaic covenant that God makes with his people, when he says in Exodus chapter 6, verse 7, I will take you as my people and I will be your God. That... that that promise, that covenant, I'll be your God and you will be my people, gets repeated again and again in the scriptures. It gets repeated in the prophets. Ezekiel says in 37, 27, My dwelling place shall be over them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Jeremiah 30, 22 says, And you shall be my people and I will be your God. And just in case, you know, just so you know, I'm not just, you know, cherry picking scriptures here. This, this idea, this promise, this covenant is found throughout scripture and it's embodied in the hope of everything they want out of their faith, everything they hope God will be, and that it becomes remembered and a part of the promise for all time. When in Revelation 21 3 it says, He will dwell with them, they will be His peoples, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. The promise that he will be our God and we will be his people is the biblical message of God's relationship with us. No wonder it gets remembered and put into the very first song we sang today. Come, let us worship and bow down. He will be our God and we will be his people like sheep eating from his hand. And so this is a promise that God has said that what he is hoping for and desiring out of us is a wonderful relationship. And so when I think if that is what faith is, 
And faith is more than just hitting a laundry list of things we need to do. Then sin is a broken relationship with God. Sin is a disorientation from God. And that eureka moment for me changed the way I approached prayer. I used to approach prayer at the end of the day, be like, okay, God, how have I messed up today? <laughs> how, how, how have I messed up? Got to get the forgiveness for. And it changed to, okay, God, how can I live closer to you tomorrow? How can I be in a better relationship and love you and, and uh, my neighbor better tomorrow? And so when Jesus says to the paralytic who comes down from the roof, your sins are forgiven, I find myself not thinking, I wonder what he did. Because maybe it isn't just about what he might have done, but it's about his relationship with God. It isn't just that Jesus knows something about this paralytic that we don't know. He's saying to him, whatever is separating you from God, whatever society has said separates you from God, does not factor when God wants to work in your life. When Jesus offers forgiveness, he is saying they're able to draw near in a relationship with God. And this flies in the face of what it had meant throughout the Old Testament, understanding of what it meant to be holy. To be holy always meant to be able to draw near to God. And so there are all kinds of holiness practices so you could draw closer to the temple or so the priest could get to the holy of holies. The, the whole, there's all kinds of ways that to draw near to God means to take care of everything that's wrong with you. And the only thing we bring before God is that which is perfect. And so if something is not perfect, it is not holy, it is unclean. We talked a lot about this when we talked about Jesus healing the leper a couple weeks ago that anything that was outside the norm of what they expected out of a body was considered unclean, unwell, not right with God. And so this paralytic is forgiven, and he's forgiven while he is still paralyzed. Any distance, any mark on him that he isn't good enough, he isn't well enough, is absolutely overcome when Jesus says, you are forgiven. All that messiness doesn't get in the way of God's desire to have a restored relationship with us. And it doesn't matter how broken anyone else thinks we are either. God says, I have loved you and, draw, and desire to draw near. And that brings the ire of the scribes, the resentment of the leaders. They start wondering, wait a minute, how can he be doing this? How can he be saying he's forgiven? There's a whole protocol for this. Who does Jesus think he is? And so Jesus says, why are you thinking about this? Which is easier to say? And this is an amazing statement. What is easier to say? On the one hand, we recognize, well, it's easier just to tell someone, hey, your sins are forgiven. Don't worry about it. It's all good. Because like, there's nothing tangible there. You, you, could, you could just say it and it could just be, so, and you could just like imagine it or something. But when Jesus says to them, your sins are forgiven, he is pronouncing on them a new reality. And even the scribes are recognizing that too. But Jesus is saying, would it have been easier for me to say, get up and take your mat and walk? If I removed the barrier that made it seem like there's no way that he can draw near to God, if I removed that barrier, would that be easier? It, it may not be easier, I mean, because telling someone to just get up and walk is not going to be an easy thing. Anyone can hope for that, but not anyone can make, make that actually happen. And so, but it's a great turn of phrase because while it might be easier to say, it might be easier just to blaspheme, Jesus is saying to them that sometimes what comes first is God's drawing near in forgiveness, that that's the first move that God makes. And in Mark chapter 1, when Jesus had all the authority to remove the devils, and when God had all the authority to bring healing, he now uses this instance of healing to say, I also have authority to forgive sins, to restore us to a relationship with our God. Jesus is saying, I can set someone up to be in a position of forgiveness. Jesus is saying, I can show, show that I have the authority to do this just by saying, get up, take your mat, and walk. And so he does. And he says that to the paralytic, get up, take your mat and walk. And he does. 
and he walks out of the home, it says. And I try to imagine what's happening here. Do, do the crowds in amazement split and move so that the person who's, who was paralyzed is now able to get out unheeded? Or are more people crowding in? Wait, a paralyzed person got healed? What's happening? Are the crowds thicker now that now this paralyzed person, when he gets up, he isn't just walking on weak Bambi-like legs, wondering, how do I do this again? No, for him to get through the crowd, he had to learn the shoulder shuffle. He's got full range of motion. He is good to go. This place was packed, and he's healed enough to make his way through the crowd, and he walks out easily enough for them all to see. This is a story about God still breathing life into dust, uh, into all the moments where we say, okay, God, what, what happens here? What now? And so we go into this season committed to also bring forgiveness, Committed also to overthrow the thoughts and socially conditioned ideas that make us think someone else might not be good enough, but to recognize God's able to forgive and God's able to draw near. During this season, it's often a season where we, we, we step back and maybe, maybe fast from something, maybe commit to something, but if there's anything that we might do during this season in preparation for Easter, the highest calling would be to remember that God's love surprises us with where it goes and to commit to loving and bringing forgiveness wherever God is pleased to bring it. That we could recognize that forgiveness is at hand for us and all those who are near. And this is regardless of whether or not there's any healing. For Jesus first speaks those words before any healing takes place, before any change takes place. For we know all too well, healing doesn't always come as we desire in these moments. But yet, here is Jesus saying, it doesn't mean God isn't near. It doesn't mean we can't have a relationship with Him. Quite the opposite. God is pleased to surprise us with where He is moving. And He is with us in ashen moments, in mournful moments. Indeed, what we might find is He is breathing life again into us, wherever we find ourselves, each and every week. Let's pray together. Lord, it's my hope and it's my prayer that we would remember to turn to you in each and every moment, in the dark times and the hard times, and see, Lord, that you are the God who is still at work. You are still the God who breathes life into these kinds of moments. And Heavenly Father, we celebrate with you when those, when those moments indeed bring glimpses of life, when glimpses of hope, bring healing. Lord, we celebrate those moments and we praise you for that. And we look forward to, to, uh, to what you will continue to do. But Lord, we are so thankful for that in the moments when, uh, when that doesn't come, that you are still the God who says, you are, you are forgiven. You are a child in the family of God. You have been brought into that relationship. And there is healing, there is forgiveness of our souls that we, Lord, are reunited with you. And it's my prayer, it's my hope that as we go forth into this week, that we would go with the expectation and the hope that indeed you are at work and those who have not yet uh, who, who, we, who may not have yet broken into our lives, that we haven't yet met, but yet you might surprise us. So Lord, help us as we leave this place to go reflecting your love and your grace, that we would recognize you are the God who still draws near to us, desires to breathe life anew into this world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. We're going to come we're going to receive um, communion. Uh, sim- uh, symbols of Christ's broken body and, broken, uh, and shed blood for us. And we take it in remembrance and hope that God breathed life anew into those broken bodies. And God is still breathing life into the dust of this world. Come forward and receive God's grace. This bread represents Christ's body broken for us. His body where God's grace was pleased to dwell and pleased to breathe in new life. Take and eat this in remembrance and be thankful. This cup represents the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ shed for us for the forgiveness of sins. Hear the words of Jesus for us today. Child, your sins are forgiven. Take this in remembrance and be thankful.
where we say to the Lord, take my life, let it be consecrated. He is pleased to bring forgiveness and the power of his Holy Spirit to go with us. Go in his grace. Knowing his holiness goes with you. Amen.